Let us pray. Father, take these words and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them and take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. We pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It has often been observed that the ministry of Jesus was itinerant, peripatetic. He did not often stay in one place. He moved around. Among scholars of historical Jesus studies, this has usually been thought of as a voluntary thing that Jesus chose to be a traveling preacher. But today's gospel reading, and indeed last week's gospel reading, they seem to go together. Uh, the lectionary writers thought this lesson was so important they gave it to us twice. This passage should give us pause about this idea that Jesus t uh, decided to be a traveling preacher. From this passage and others, it seems more likely that Jesus was forced to be on the move. His migration was forced upon him. He had no place to lay his head because it was too dangerous for him to stay in one place for very long. Let's take a closer look at this passage. We need to look at last week's bit and this week's bit to make sense of them. In verse 14 of Luke 4, it says that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and a report concerning him went out through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogue, being glorified by all. Uh, and then in the next verse, it says that he went to Nazareth. He came home. This is the first bit of Jesus' ministry uh, that Luke describes. Although he knows that Jesus has already been active in Capernaum, we find that out at the end of the passage. Jesus has already been preaching and healing in Capernaum. But Luke puts this story at the head of the ministry of Jesus for programmatic reasons, for theological reasons. This story is a paradigm of the ministry of Jesus. A story in which Jesus, the, the, the whole story of Jesus, is a story which repeatedly, in, in which he repeatedly announces the good news of God's kingdom, and in other places he demonstrates it. He is at first welcomed, but eventually, ultimately, he is rejected. So he comes back to Galilee, and Luke tells us that he comes in the power of the Spirit, and this theme of the Holy Spirit becomes a dominant theme for the ministry of Jesus, but also for the ministry of the early church. All through Luke Acts, the Holy Spirit is the guiding force. He taught in the synagogues in Galilee, and he was glorified by all. And then he comes to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, Luke tells us. His hometown is a tiny place, no more than about 300 people, one square mile, one well, it's an out-of-the-way, nothing place. But it's his hometown. So he comes, and on the Sabbath, he goes into the synagogue. And Luke says, as was his custom, probably meaning it's both his custom to go to the synagogue, but also to preach, because Jesus takes the scriptures, and he reads them, and he speaks from them. We don't know whether the first century synagogue worship looked like later worship described in the Mishnah and the Talmud. We don't know if this was the lectionary reading of the day or if Jesus chose it. And in fact, it's a mixed text. It's mostly Isaiah 61, but there's a bit of Isaiah 58 thrown in for good measure. And it's a text about the Spirit and the Spirit's anointing of the Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This passage from Isaiah 61 is one of several prophetic texts in which the Spirit of God is associated with the coming Messiah and therefore the coming kingdom, because Messiah and kingdom always go together. Let me read you another one. This is from Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He shall smell in the fear of the Lord. If you want to know about that translation, uh, talk to me later. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. And then there's a description of the kingdom that the Messiah brings. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. The calf and the lion and the fatted calf together. A little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. This is what the kingdom of God is. This is what the new age is going to bring. This is what the Messiah is anointed to bring. This is why the spirit comes and rests on the Messiah. The spirit-endowed Messiah will bring the kingdom. And so Jesus announces, today, today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus effectively is announcing that the kingdom has come, that the Messiah has come, that the spirit has come, and the spirit has come on him. There is a repeated emphasis in the emphatic position in the Septuagint text of Isaiah 51. The word me stands at the ultimate point in every one of the last three lines, uh, at every one of the, the first three lines. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because to preach good news, he has anointed me. Uh, to proclaim release of the captives, he has sent me. Note, the people in the synagogue love it. All spoke well of him and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Isn't this Joseph's son? Hey, isn't that Joseph's boy? He's the Messiah. And if he's the new king who is about to reorder society and drive out the Romans, punish the wicked by the rod of his mouth and bring wonderful things to pass, that is good news for Nazareth. Our boy is going to be in charge. And if it's our guy on top, we'll do okay. Okay. Isn't this Joseph's son? That is not a put down. Of course, the reader of Luke knows better. The careful reader of Luke has seen all along that this is not Joseph's son. But the people think he's one of them, our guy. They, they kind of hope he's going to be involved in a little nepotism to help Nazareth along, to lift it up from being an out-of-the-way, out nothing town, to be, maybe being a place that has good roads, maybe more than one well. He'll make Israel, or at least Nazareth, great again. Then verse 23 he said to them, doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at Capernaum, do here also 
in your own country. The aphorism, physician, heal yourself, was used in the ancient world to mean, hey, you have the gift. Use it for yourself and for your family. Do what you did in Capernaum. Show your healing power. We know that you're a healer. Do it here. Make it benefit us. But now... Jesus ruins it. If there had been an election at that point, he would have won hands down. Electoral college and popular vote. But he ruins it. He does what preachers should never do. He preaches a second sermon. (laughs) And this one gets a different response. He said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his own country. Well, wasn't he just acceptable? (laughs) But no, he's going to explain why. Amen, I tell you. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when there came a great famine over all the land, and Elijah was sent to none but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who is a widow. There were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. He ruins it. He was doing so well. See, Jesus knows Nazareth. He knows his people are parochial, focused on their own clan, their own place, their own people, Israel. So he deliberately shatters the expectation he has set up. Yes, the kingdom has come. Yes, I'm the spirit anointed one. But this acceptable year of the Lord, this jubilee, is not what you think it is. Because God is always a God who works for, a God who fights for the outcast, the weak, widows, orphans, and yes, foreigners. God chose Israel, but God is not patriotic or nationalistic. As Paul will later say, and he got it from the Old Testament, God shows no partiality. God does not play favorites. Even the choice of Israel was so that Israel would become a blessing to all nations, Genesis 12. Be a light to the Gentiles, Isaiah 49. And so he tells or alludes to two stories. A story about Elijah and a Gentile widow, and a story about Elisha, and a Gentile leper. In these stories, God did not favor Israel. He reached beyond the borders of the land. Just as as an aside, Luke often pairs a story about a man with a story about a woman. We see this in the birth narratives where he has a story about Simeon the prophet and a story about Anna the prophet. Or in Uh, later when Jesus is teaching parables and he has a story about a shepherd who's lost a sheep and a story about a housewife who's lost a coin. Luke always likes to parallel stories of men and women. But that's an aside. God, says Jesus, loves Gentiles. Even Gentile women and Gentile lepers, even a Gentile like Naaman an enemy of Israel, the Osama bin Laden of his day. And God heals Naaman. And now we have the explosion. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Preaching the kingdom is fine. Telling us you're the chosen one, the Messiah, no problem. We need one. That he's from our town? Great. Tell us that God loves unclean Gentiles? 
the goyim, the enemies, that is going too far. So the town immediately does an about face, turning from praise to anger. They think they see. It says, their eyes were fixed on him, but they are still blind and in need of healing. Jesus is misled, they think, and dangerous and must be eliminated. They move to kill him. They act like they did when Jesus, like Herod did when Jesus was a baby. Stop this dangerous one before he gets out of control. And the result is similar to the result under Herod. Jesus escapes. But he pays the price. He becomes, in old English language, a vagabond, an itinerant, someone who has to wander because he has no home, one who has no permanent place to lay his head. He is, as Isaiah foretold, despised and rejected. Now, here's the hard part about preaching. What in the world does it have to do with us? You can see how this might apply to the people of Nazareth. But what do we do with this story? Well, we could do what many have done and turn Jesus' quotation from Isaiah 61 into a program, make it into some kind of technique. There are various options for doing this. There's a liberationist option. Jesus preached good news for the poor. Therefore, we must work for social justice. Jesus preached the year of Jubilee. So we must work to relieve the debts of the poorest nations of the world. There's a charismatic option. Jesus proclaimed recovering of sight to the blind, and he actually went around and healed people. So we should pray for the sick and start healing services in our churches. There's an evangelistic option. Preach good news. Preach forgiveness. We need to get people witnessing more so that more people will be saved. Now, don't misunderstand me. I actually think we ought to do all of those things. God's mission, and therefore the mission of the church, is holistic. It's about conversion and forgiveness of sins. It's about prayer for healing, physical, emotional, spiritual, and relational. It's about justice, lifting up the poor, liberty to the oppressed. All good. All necessary. All things we need to do. Because God is doing them. But wait, is that what the text is actually teaching? That we need to turn this story into a program. That we need to find the practical application for our daily lives. That we need to find the technique in the story. In my mailbox yesterday, I got a great document. Uh, It's called... Tactical Operations Manual? Is that what it's called? Plan. Plan. The Tactical Operations Plan. I think Colin Powell wrote it. It it does sound kind of militaristic. And I had a quick look through it, not a very thorough look through it, and it's really good. It, It gives us help in knowing what in the world we're doing here. It's important. It's a great document. But there's a danger It's the danger that the Nazarenes themselves fell into. It's the danger that the church often falls into. The danger of turning Jesus into a package for our benefit. It's the danger of saying, thanks, Jesus. Got it? I'll take it from here. It's the danger of separating the kingdom from the king The danger is that we ignore the thrice-repeated, emphatic me that we find in Isaiah 61. The me that points not to me, but to Jesus. 
when we divorce anything, even good things, healing, worship, evangelism, justice, when we divorce those things from the one who brings those things, we are all in grave danger of making idols. And so we need to reimagine for a moment who we are in this story. I suspect, I suspect most of us, as we read this story, imagine ourselves in the synagogue in Nazareth and hearing Jesus preaching. And I think probably most of us imagine ourselves or hope that we would have a different response from the people of Nazareth that we would be willing to follow Jesus, not to try to put him to death. But maybe we need to put ourselves in a different place in the story. Perhaps in the place of the widow healed by Elijah or the leper healed by Elisha. Because we are outside of this story. We are, as Hosea said, not God's people. We are people in need. We are people who are powerless in ourselves to help ourselves. And yet God's grace comes to that widow. God's grace comes to that leper. From outside our, that story, God pulls us in. We are the poor, the blind, the captive, those in need of release. We are the people who should not be quick to turn the words of Jesus into a packaged program, but rather we are people who need to turn to him for mercy. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, heal me. Lord Jesus, feed me. Lord Jesus, help me. Because it's only when we do that, it's only when we throw away the idols, it's only when we turn to the king that we have the kingdom thrown in. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, send your grace and mercy to us. Help us not to fall into the temptation of using you for our own success. But help us to follow you wherever you lead. knowing that you have no place to lay your head and knowing that you are on your way to Jerusalem, to the cross. We pray these things in your name. Amen. 